long in that. <laughs> the only time I get to San Diego is in it's Comic Con, though, and, and it's just like, overwhelmed you know. by superheroes. Yes, <laughs> not enough time. Is it like this all year? Yes. <laughs> so, the actors, of course, were a little bit challenged to tell us very much about this next season. What can you guys share about what's happening to you? We're in the same boat. There's very little we can tell you. Um, although, there are some things we can tell you. Um, one of them is that, you know, we, we dig much deeper into the alt realities and why they're relevant to our, to the narrative that you enjoy. I mean, first of all, it's important that we didn't overwhelm the audience with the kind of, you know, head fuck, essentially, of, of what alternate realities are, how they work. Um, but in this season, it all starts to come together. And it comes together to give us a picture of hope and the potential of change. <laughs> So which ones are we going to be visiting if you can share any? <laughs> other realities. Other realities. There's infinite other realities. You, you can choose them. There will be a number that we that we have that we see, through, mostly through films. Oh, through films. We'll also learn the origin of the first film and we'll sort of get a better understanding of what that is and what that means and why they're coming. So there's some of that explained too. Will you explain who gets to go into those realities? Because Juliana yes. obviously can to go, Miguel will obviously do it, but not everybody seems to. In a way. You may have to wait till the last episode to understand yeah. the fundamental ways. Right. Right. Uh, but also we start we start exploring an idea that came from some unpublished work by uh, Isis Fire. Um, which was wonderful for us to be able to do this, where he imagined the Nazis trying to punch their way into alternate realities to spread their Nazi ideology across the multiverse. And that's one of, that's the big idea for this season. That's the big idea. And we're, we want to, we've, we're focusing on resistance and what that means in all forms. We felt like that was really important at the beginning of the season. We talked a lot about notion of resistance and how we can depict that and um, giving people a sense of hope in such a dark world, which feels like we need right now. Yeah. <laughs> the last time I think I spoke with you was two years ago during the presidential elections here. Mm -hmm. and Did I about say something tactless? I may have <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. It, but you, you said, and I, and I interviewed a lot of people that year, and, and there was kind of a theme. Um, of where this world was heading, not just here in the United States, but in Europe as well. And what you're saying now is this idea of resistance and, and this, the multiverse and the Nazis trying to punch through the multiverse. Um, is that, are you playing off of metaphorically what's happening in this world now? No. <laughs> uh, no, bad? that wasn't, I mean, you know, the, the source material for our inspiration was written in 1962. Of course it is. And, but it's never not relevant. I think we're just living in a time where it feels more relevant than ever because we're living at a time where we can see intolerances and prejudices coming back and, and you know, populist nationalist ideologies, and not just in this country, but across the developed world. Um, look at the, the EU right now, it's tearing itself apart with anti-immigrant policies and right-wing governments being elected. And, you know, these are historic swings and roundabouts that, that Philip K. Dick himself predicted yes. and knew we were never free from and never safe from. Um, so in a way, the world is reflecting us, not the other way around. We're not, you know, the inspiration for this comes from our own historic legacy and from the mind of, of Isis' father. It's just more relevant now than we would have liked. An interesting. Exploring these multiverses, is it possible to like recruit, like if Frank didn't blow himself up in last season, could you go into one of the multiverses and pull him out of one to bring him back? You could if you know how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's entirely possible we could see him again. But he oh, could yes. not do that himself. You, no. you cannot meet, you can't meet yourself on another. So if Juliana went in search of him, she could find him. Potentially. Yeah. Just that one. would depend on a few different well, there's been talk that maybe the actor was going to be back this season. I was thinking, geez, if he blew himself to smithereens, where are we going to find him from? <laughs> well, the answer to that question will be revealed. <laughs> the, yes, what happened? Well, what about Joe Blake? How quickly will we see his fate? Well, he, when you last saw him, he was being carted off to a Nazi prison. You will catch up with Joe and find out what happens to him. In the first episode, actually, you see what happens to him. And his his arc this season is really, really interesting because up until now, 
he's been a very ambiguous character. He he's clearly not a devoted Nazi, and yet he's you know he's been raised under Nazism, Nazi ideology. He's trying to make his way and decide which path he's going to take. And this is fundamental to Philokidit's writings. You know, your choices define who you are, and and your moral choices in particular. So we put him on that course where, from the first episode, he's forced into making some moral choices, which is very dramatic and very shocking. Well, then this season you've introduced Wyatt Price. What can you tell us about him? Wyatt Price. Yeah, Price. Um, well, Wyatt Price is a character um, who's part of the waifs and strays of Europe that, that escaped Nazis in Europe in this, during the Second World War and fled to America and then found himself caught up in a resistance struggle there. And then we catch up with his story, you know, 20 years after he fled uh, in the neutral zone, which, as we know, is a territory that is a buffer zone between the Japanese Pacific states and the Reich. And he is a criminal. He is a black marketeer and a wheeler dealer, and, um, but part of him is inspired by meeting Juliana Corrin, and I can't tell you much more than that. But the the, the journey he begins, the relationship he begins with Juliana Corrin, um, becomes a very important driving device right through the season and into the future. And Trudy, what about Trudy? We pick up with her story too. We do. <laughs> and you and you find out you find out why she's there. Yes. Mm -hmm. And and you know that there are people who can cross. Sorry. It wasn't a hallucination. <laughs> so I know like the answers and questions are limited because you know everything's still under wraps. But going back to the beginning, like what attracted you both to tell a story like this and to create this universe for viewers at home and like what what was the push I guess to start this whole thing? <laughs> I well you know I. Well, I came to this because um, you know, my relationship with Frank and then later with Easton and David Zucker. Um, when I first read the first script of this, it blew my mind because it was about something so important. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, which is, I, I don't just mean the, the potential of fascism take over the world, but, but really about um, our choices as human beings and how they affect our our lives and our decisions and our um, and who we are and who we want to be and it, it's, it sounds very vague to say that but there's very few dramas that really confront you with the ramifications of, of our choices and um, and I felt even then how relevant and important that was and it's so exciting to to deal with an alternate reality, the what if scenario, but in a way that was so concrete. Okay. Particularly now, mm. yeah. the world we live in now. Can you talk a little bit about electric dreams? I, your father's work is taking oh. like all over the place. Did you see electric dreams? Yeah. yeah, it's one of my husband's and my favorite binge shows. So because not in a high castle. So <laughs> it's so weird. Really, <laughs> the show is so hard to do because they were, it was just you know mini movies so we had no assets to carry over different writers directors for each one different stories so it's a real challenge you know setting up different worlds with less prep time than we have on high castle and less money you can believe that so it was, it was a challenge um we're, we're developing additional episodes we don't have any news one way or the other we're developing so it's fun. It's fun though doing the short little. It's great, you know. And it's becoming much more popular now doing it and like anthology. Yeah, yeah. 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 Did you great. see the one with Janelle Monae in it? Yes. Yeah. Oh, so. It was yeah. like Rachel did that. I just adore her. Yeah, she's I'm great. A huge fan. I asked her to do it. Yeah. And she and did. she agreed. It's great. She's a big fan of that. So. Uh, as are many of us. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that lovely? So apparently. <laughs> You guys are good. aiming towards the season four, so this season is going to feel like there's like a massive push towards next season, or are we going to have a lot more answers that kind of contain itself this season? Um, with all the answers, we offer up more questions. There are, but there there are a lot of answers to things. There are some 
surprising story turns, narrative turns that are that aren't just leading up to something else, but they are in of themselves a completion of something. That sounds very vague, but well, it's just that there was such a large gap between seasons two and three to yeah. be left completely hanging again. You're like, what? I know, so long. Yeah. All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you guys.